Mark Kester, welcome to Sports Management Podcast. Thank you, Marcus. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. And uh, for those who might not you know who you are, you are the founder of the Players NIL. So just to you know, rip off the bandaid straight away. Start with the basics. What is NIL? Well, it's uh, something that's actually been around for a long time. It, it refers to name, image, and likeness which actually means a person's right to manage and control their, as it says, name, image, and likeness, so their personal public property. In professional athletes, it's been going on forever. As we grew up with kids, there were professional athletes in Europe and the United States that sponsored products that created a brand, you know, interacting with public society. But in July of 2021, the U.S. first time ever allowed college athletes and now high school athletes to benefit from their name images like this without losing their athletic eligibility. Yeah, and uh, of course that creates a huge opportunity for college athletes uh, to now be able to, you know, make money out of of their college career. So uh, talk a little bit about your venture, the Players NIL and uh, what you do uh, with these college athletes. Yeah, so first of all, I want to just slightly correct something that you said and and it isn't your it isn't you it's the perception that everyone has because that's what we talk about and everyone thinks it's about money they think and they read and the news sensationalizes the star athletes in the united states and the money that they're receiving and there are several of them um, that are receiving lots of money seven figures plus no question that that's true but uh, i'm here to tell you that that is not the majority of athletes the majority of athletes are everyday you know, lower level athletes in sports that maybe aren't as televised or as publicized as others in the United States. And so um, we're here to educate and empower all athletes, but specifically the 98% that don't have access to, you know, tremendous tools because of their celebrity on the field and actually have to create what we call real NIL, R-E-A-L, which is you get paid to transact, whether it's a social post or an appearance or an autograph or you're selling apparel or you're creating some type of value for a brand that you that pays you. That's what NIL really is meant to be. We've just hijacked the story because we talk about and sensationalize those top level athletes. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, good that you, spe- <clears throat> you know made that clear for the audience. So to talk a little bit about the players, NIL. What is it that you do with your company? Yeah, so we, we've uh, put together an educational product that involves several pieces, but mostly it's around building a personal brand and creating uh, individual uh, value by telling a story and, and creating an audience. In the first two years of NIL here in the United States, 74% of NIL deals are based on social media. So in other words, being an influencer. And I tell everyone with a smile that the Kardashians – have changed the world, right? Influencer marketing is a real thing. Now, athletes have an opportunity to actually expand upon that because fan, sports fan, is actually short for fanatic, which means that you have a rabid following of followers and supporters and people that are interested in you. So your job as an athlete is to grow and expand that audience by telling a story, sharing who you are, what you're interested in. Is it math? Is it science? Is it travel? Is it food? Is it sneakers, apparel? And then creating leverage as an influencer by taking that audience and matching it against a brand that's interested in connecting with them. Mm. So you have uh, some pillars, five pillars, right, of the education. Do you want to just touch a little bit about the, what it is that this course uh, include? Yeah, so these are the pillars that I've developed over a lifetime involved in athletics as an athlete, as a parent, as a coach, as a CEO in business. And these are what I feel are fundamental pillars that are necessary for young people today, and specifically athletes in this case, to master in order to create opportunities, professional opportunities in the future. And I don't mean professional sports, I mean job and career. The first one is digital marketing. And as I alluded to, it's about telling a story and growing an audience, not just your friends and family circle. So not just the people that follow you because you live in the same town but how do you grow that audience how do you tell a story and create a greater following the second pillar is how do you leverage that with a brand that's called influencer marketing so digital marketing is one influencer marketing is two 
we delve into some tax and legal and compliance issues, which are pretty much relevant to athletes in the United States. Number four is a pillar that is universal around the world, and that is community service and philanthropy. And how do you build your brand by expanding your audience by giving back and telling your story of charitable and philanthropy uh, contributions to society? We believe that athletes enjoy a level of celebrity unlike the average person, and it's their responsibility to give back, and it's a great way to build a brand. That's pillar four. The fifth and final pillar is financial literacy. And just as it suggests, you know, if you have a few dollars or if you're trying to make a few dollars at a young age, how you can set yourself up for success long term by understanding the power of money and the pitfall of, of money. Yeah, so you mentioned that you have, uh, Kerry, you have been, you're, you're a father to college athletes, you have been one yourself, and uh, I've read a lot about also your father was involved a lot as well in the athletics. So how did uh, this come to, like, why did you decide also to help the, the college athletes? Because I see that this is dear to you. Yes, uh, thank you for recognizing that. Uh, we have two foundational principles of our business. The first is, and again, this is universal. How do you use athletics to better your life, right? You create academic opportunities, professional opportunities, career opportunities, social opportunities to meet people, life skills. And I think young people today can do it a number of ways. As I said, you can do it with math and science and technology. You can be involved in history. There's lots of ways to have a passion. But for those of us who athletics has touched, it's a great way to build a foundation. Once that career is over, which it is for everyone at some point, the second principle of our business is how do you use athletics to better the lives of the people around you? My father was an educator, and he taught me the first principle as a young teenager, and I was able to do that to get a college scholarship to play sports in college. The second principle came to me when I became a father, and I realized that I wanted to use athletics to better the lives of my children. It then grew to my community, friends and family, people I lived in the town with, and I became a, a leader in terms of creating opportunities for young people to use athletics to better their lives. Then professionally, I did the same thing. I was involved in the sports and entertainment business, and it was there that I used athletics in our business to empower young people in life and business skills. And we ran a successful program in Los Angeles, California, and Hollywood, hired 26 people through this uh, development program, 13 of whom ended up becoming full-time employees, and six of them own their own businesses today. So I've always been about empowering others and using my platform as an athlete, as an athletic leader, as a CEO, to better the lives of the people around me. And the players NIL is just a natural progression of that mentality. I love that. My father was also an entrepreneur, and he said that the, the biggest like achievement for him was when he saw <clears throat> that employees that he trained moved on to bigger things later on. And then he saw that you know, as a coaching thing and a validation of his work. So I love that. So yeah, let's dig into your career a little bit. You mentioned there that you were in Hollywood, so with Sports Studio, but you were also president for uh, IAS Athletic Apparel. I read, so you want to take it from there and then you know see how your career uh, went on up until today? Yeah, so in 2008, I got an opportunity to move to California and begin working with a company that <clears throat> was involved in uh, creating and building uh, athletic uniforms for high schools and colleges, but also for Hollywood, for TV shows and movies. So some of the great movies in the history of American sports movies, Any Given Sunday, The Replacement, Miracle, We Are Marshall, Eight Men Out, Field of Dreams. This company built and created the uniforms for those movies. And my first job with the company was running the manufacturing facility, actually making uniforms and working with the Hollywood component and with the direct-to-team sports component. In 2010, I became the president and CEO of the entire organization. And uh, it was there that we really started to gain traction because we became a sole licensee to supply what we call production services to scripted sports content in Hollywood. So TV shows, movies, commercials, photo shoots, feature films. And we did everything around the sports action. We did all the casting, the choreography, the props, the uniforms, the product placement. And we were the exclusive licensee for that National Football League, Major League Baseball, NBA, U.S. Soccer, Major League Soccer, a lot of college programs. And so I learned a lot about 
athletes and marketing and branding and agents and production, uh, sponsorship, uh, group licensing, these types of things, which really set me up for the name, image, and likeness opportunity. Mm. And uh, at Sports Studios, you were working a lot with uh, sporting uh, teams and leagues as well, NFL, NBA, MLB. So, uh, and I read a story there that you had some, uh, you know, you got in contact with the NFL through some type of a legal uh, case. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so the history of the company was they had made uniforms for commercials for the National Football League for many years without authorization, without licensing. There was no licensing in those days, so they didn't actually break any rules. But the NFL had been on a journey to consolidate uh, all of their licensed partners. They saw a revenue stream there. And so all of a sudden, the NFL was in control of all the aspects of the on-field uniforms, from the footwear to the headwear to the uniforms to the gloves and all of the accessories, the Gatorade containers, the headsets. They were licensing everything. And uh, just so happened that it coincided with me being announced as president and CEO of Sports Studio. My first day on the job in the corner office, I was sitting there. I called my father. I said, I, I made it to the corner office. I thought I was a pretty big deal. And in through the door comes the FedEx delivery man with an envelope. And it was a cease and desist letter from the National Football League telling me we could no longer do what was about 60% of our business at the time. I very quickly came back to earth. And I realized that uh, I had some work to do. And um, it wasn't that uh, the NFL was restricting us. They just wanted to control what was going on and wanted to partner with us. So I took that opportunity and went to New York City and sat down. And we hammered out the first ever uh, entertainment license with the National Football League, where we became their eyes and ears in Hollywood. We controlled all of the uh, content that was being approved or not approved. We could, we protected the sponsors. We protected the league in the NFL. Like they like to say that we protected the shield and we became really valuable partners to them. And I think uh, it proved to be a great relationship, which we then leveraged with basketball, baseball, soccer, etc. That's awesome. And, you know, just to make that, you know, make something good out of that because as you said, like you made it to the corner office, then getting this type of pushback, but then being able to, you know, move forward and continue and you had this in mind. So uh, how, how was that like, you know, to go from this high to getting the promotion to then the down to then working up with, to make this deal with the NFL? Well, you know, part of the, the mantra of using athletics to better your life is fighting through adversity, right? And trying to figure out solutions to problems. You know, in American football, we go by 10 yards at a time, first down, second down, third down, fourth down. And sometimes it's third down and a long way to go. And you have to figure out how are you going to get a first down? And I think business is like that. Life is like that. And thank God I had the foundation that my father gave me and that athletics gave me. And I knew that there was a solution. I didn't know what it was. I didn't really know what the National Football League was interested in or not interested in. But I knew if we communicated and we talked about it that, we were doing good work and that we were doing it for the right reasons. And I thought that we could probably come up with a solution. And then you started uh, the Players NIL. You have also uh, written a book on the same topic. You had the NIL podcast and then the course that we talked about. So what made you take this jump to start this company and become an entrepreneur? Well, we sold Sports Studio in June of 21. And uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. Name, image, and likeness was approved by the federal courts in July of 21, so just one month later. And I saw lots of the same things that I'd seen in Hollywood, Marcus. I saw, you know, adults taking advantage of kids that weren't educated. And given my background and given my principles, I thought the one thing that was missing was education. And so we launched the Players NIL in, uh, in, in 2021 and in, was in hopes of trying to empower athletes and create opportunities. We've had a few distractions that I mentioned earlier, most importantly, that people think that NIL is only for the famous athletes. And we're trying to make NIL more relatable and attainable. And in one way, one of the ways that we've done that is I wrote a book called NIL for All. It's a 30 minute read. It's a paperback. It's just a basic introduction, basically about sports marketing and about athlete branding and personal branding. And it's a great you know, synopsis on all the things that you need to understand in order to be successful in this space. Mm, great. I will put the link in the show notes for the book as well if someone wants to uh, 
by that. And you talked about your principles. I know. I think it's really admirable that you have this education platform and the book and so on. Because you said that you didn't want to be like an agency. You didn't want to take commission from these kids and you know take advantage of them. So instead of you know you could that's an easy I guess you know if you're just chasing the money you used to take a commission try to make money but you took the high road and you know you try to educate these kids we talked about financial literacy so again you really follow your principles through you know hard times and in good times it seems yeah well remember you know using athletics to better the lives of the people around us that doesn't mean better the day right it's a long-term thing it's not a four-year relationship it's a 40-year relationship on trying to build good citizens good partners in life, good parents, good employees, good um, uh, people. And I think that NIL creates an opportunity to do that if it's followed and the principles are are guided properly. Um, I think today's athletes have a tremendous opportunity to make a difference in the world. Mm. So where do we stand now in the United States? Like what states allow NIL? Where is it, uh, you know, up and coming? Which state is next? Where? How is the landscape right now in the U.S.? Well, there's two different categories. So first, in co collegiate athletics, of which in the United States, there's 500,000 kids playing sports in college this year. Okay. Uh, so that's all sports, right? From football, basketball, baseball, soccer, hockey, lacrosse, everything. And so in college, it's authorized across the country. It's a nationwide um, opportunity. In high school, about 34 states have it right now. Uh, we think that that's going to go to 50 states in the not too distant future. There's just some conversation around what should the rules be. And right now, every state has their own rules, and that's caused a few problems and headaches. Um, but I think uh, the future is nothing but upside. Um, we are, again, sensationalizing those great athletes. And I don't know where that's going to lead. It may lead to uh, revenue sharing because there's so much money for the television rights for some of these programs. But I think in the non-revenue sports, so not football, not basketball, um, it's going to create lifetime opportunities. And I think we're just figuring out, we're just beginning to understand what those opportunities may be. And I think coaches and administrators are starting to say, hey, what is this? How do I take advantage of it? How can it help my program? How can it help my alumni, my local business, my parents, my kids, my administrators and coaches below me? And I think we're just in the beginning after two years of realizing that NIL is for everyone and again, that's the title of my book, NIL for All. Mm. Uh, what are the top NIL sports? I heard that in another interview that you talked about that, and I found that really interesting. Yeah, so as you would expect, American football is number one. It's the biggest college sport out there. Yeah. Number two is men's basketball. Number three is women's basketball. Number four is one of the fastest growing sports in collegiate athletics, and that is women's volleyball. And uh, this is in terms of value of NIL deals is the category that we're classifying. And six of the top 10 sports are women's sports right now. And part of the reason is that no offense to men out there and young boys, but women and girls are better at social media than boys. And so social media, remember, is 74% of most of NIL deals. And so, um, you know, being active on social, being good on social, uh, being, um, you know, conversive and connecting with an audience is important and sometimes girls do it better than boys mm. yeah definitely so you mentioned 74 percent is social media so what other types of <laughs> nil deals are there outside of social media yeah so there's appearances you know coming to a, a restaurant or coming to a car dealership and signing autographs right there's merchandise you know signing helmets signing jerseys uh there's other deals where you can represent products um, in terms of, uh, you know, affiliate marketing. So you can, you know, get consumer deals sent out to your audience with discount codes and things like that. But the majority, as I said, is based on social media. Mm. Uh, does this, the NIL, does that allow players to focus more on their also sporting performance since they don't maybe need to take in, you know, they have more, maybe they don't have an extra job or they can do this instead and focus more on school and on their sport? Or how do you see, what benefits do you see except for the financial one that NIL brings to these college athletes? Well, first of all, I think, you know, uh, building a social media platform and building a brand takes time. It is a job, okay? It does take consistent effort. 
you may not be mowing lawns, you may not be painting houses, you may not be bagging groceries at the grocery store, but creating content takes time, editing it to storytelling takes time. So I'm not sure exactly, but I think the time is probably similar. It is a job, okay? But this job, you know, um, will provide opportunities because in your storytelling, you can expand upon your interest and you can connect with businesses and individuals that may provide internships, may provide job opportunities, career learning. You may become an entrepreneur, start your own business. So many young people today, especially post pandemic, they don't want to go back to an office, right? They don't want to sit down in an office from nine to five, the old traditional model. And so they want to be more flexible and they want to own their own business or be entrepreneur or be part of a tech startup. And this is a great way to jumpstart your professional career. If we, NFTs are something that, you know, was uh, really booming in like a few years back. It's still ongoing, obviously. Is that a big part of NIL as well? It isn't today. I believe that NFTs do have a future. And this is just a personal opinion. I'm not in the NFT business. But uh, NFT stands for non-fungible token. Essentially, it's a digital asset, right? It could be a picture. It could be uh, an art piece. It could be anything that you can transfer digitally. And um, the blockchain allows for the continued path of ownership of that asset. Athletics has always been about about, um, uh, memorabilia and about marketing assets such as photographs. Some of the most iconic sports photographs in the world are digital assets now. They've been digitized, right? And so I think there is a future where athletes will control their images from their competition and revenue share with their schools. And I think that those assets can be monetized through NFTs. But my opinion is NFTs will be more of a collector's item. And the story and the scenario that I share is hopefully next summer, I'm going to take my two-year-old grandson to his first sport live sporting event. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be great if I could have a digital asset, group of digital assets commemorating that day, perhaps a ticket, perhaps a photograph from the day, right? Perhaps the program, perhaps some video highlight from a home run or a basket or a touchdown. And I could hand that, deliver that to my grandson. It may not be worth anything to anyone else, but to him, it digitizes and memorializes his first sporting event with his grandfather. And I think that's a realistic scenario that we're probably not far away from. And that would be a real great case for NFT usage. But of course, sports memorabilia at some point will become part of it, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, going back to your own story, we have <clears throat> talked about it a little bit, but uh, how did you get into sports in the first place? Like, did you play many sports when you were a kid or how did that interest start? Yeah, I, I guess my father. My father was a college athlete and uh, an athletic ed- educator. He was a gym teacher. And so athletics was always part of his life and part of my life as a child. Um, I just gravitated towards it. You know, I was probably a little bit bigger than the rest of the kids in the neighborhood. So I had some success and I got expelled from the neighborhood because I was too big and dominant. And I had to ride my bike to the other side of town and play with the older kids, which was a great experience. It provided lots of life skills and opportunities. And so athletics was always part of my life. And, uh, you know, using athletics to better your life just became a way of life for me. Hmm. And uh, you, yeah, because you played uh, football, right? You were a division two football player. Yes, I was. So that was the that was your sport, American football, as we well my here. my lo- my love was basketball. I mm-hmm. just wasn't good enough to play in college, so I played football at a mid what we call Division two, so a middle level school here. But it was on scholarship, and I played all four years, and some of the best friends of my life, and you know used athletics in a way that you know I never dreamed of as a child, but as it ended up, really a foundational piece of my life. Um, you're from New York, right? You initially, Correct. yeah. And then you, yep. you, we talked about before, you know, moving to California. So, uh, how was that change from to go from New York to California? Well, it's quite a change. I actually lived, uh, born and raised on Long Island, which is you know a suburb of New York City. So, all of that excitement and energy around being near a city. But I really actually raised my family four hours north in central New York in a country town. And then moving to the big city of Los Angeles was a culture shock, right? The number of people, the cars, the cost of living, uh, the competitiveness 
of the people. Okay, I think um, California often is uh, criticized or categorized as being laid back and cool. I actually found Hollywood to be as competitive as New York. You know, in New York, they may say no to you. In Hollywood, they say yes, and then they don't do anything. So it's a little bit different mindset. But the competitiveness, and if, you, if you're not good at your job, if you're not good at what you do, there's a bunch of people waiting to take over. So I think, you know, professionally, it was a really good injection of energy and really challenged me. Uh, socially um, and lifestyle-wise, California, you know, offers lots to do and lots to see and way different than New York. I really enjoyed my time there. How do you, you know, talking about the, now the college athletes and uh, NIL and everything, like uh, work-life balance for these kids or like the life outside of sport, or to, is that something that's important to teach kids or what is your stance on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the things that we're seeing in today's athletes are, are mental health issues, right? And they're based on the fact that their whole life from childhood on has been about sports. They play the same sport year round or they play sports year round. They're under pressure to win the parents, the coaches, the community, everyone cheers for them. And they're feeling a sense of entitlement to some degree, but also the pressure to compete and be successful. At some point, some in high school, some in college, some as pros, sports is taken away. You're done competing. And uh, what I've seen in my career, in my life is lots of athletes who don't have any direction. They don't have any self-worth because their whole value was around sports. And I think one of the hidden um, success stories that has yet to come out, but will soon, is the mental health aspect of building a brand away from sports. Are you interested in bicycles? Are you interested in cooking? Are you a fashion person? Are you an artist? You know, are you a complex person that sports is just part of your not life, not your whole life? And so I think, you know, it's good, it's healthy for kids to get away from sports for a period of time for them to heal physically, mentally, emotionally. And you can do that by building self-worth away from your sport. And there's lots of ways to do it, but I think NIL is one of the ways. Yeah, and uh, we talked about the pillars of your education before, financial literacy also. We talked about uh, mm -hmm. personal branding. I mean, the you identify as an athlete when you are an athlete, but there will come a day when you are no longer an athlete. So what do you do then? So I think that's, as you said, and then a lot of the mental health issues come in then because you have some type of identity crisis. Maybe you didn't get the financial literacy course and uh, you haven't uh, invested your money good, you haven't invested them well, and now you're seeing you're 35 years old, your career is, uh, sporting career is over, and you have hopefully another, you know, 50 plus years. So what do you do then? Right, right. Well, I think, you know, again, but that's, you know, that's a very small percentage of athletes, right? Yeah. That's the really high level professionals. And, and there's yeah. horror stories all over the world of people not using their money properly. But what about the kid that's in college that's 20, 21 years old that all of a sudden is making $3,000 a month, $4,000 a month, right, besides being on scholarship? If managed properly, that's life-changing money 50 years down the road. You can take that nest egg and manage it properly. You can invest in real estate or whatever that you want to, business stocks, but manage properly and, and stay away from the pitfalls of money can provide you an opportunity when you're 35, 40, 50 years old and later. And that's what we teach. You're a father of five. So what do you tell your kids on, uh, you know, on this topic? What do you teach them? Yeah. Well, my kids are, are retired and gone. So they're, they're not no longer competing. Although I have one that is a coach, but you know, I think it's evolved. Uh, you know, I think every young parent thinks they have all the answers and they don't. I didn't. I made lots of mistakes. Uh, but I, this is my parenting philosophy. I think the two greatest things that parents can give their kids are confidence and opportunity. And again, there's different ways to give kids confidence. It can be through sports. It can be through art, math, science, history. But give them the confidence and then the opportunity. You know, what do parents do? They sacrifice. They provide opportunities, whether it be coaching, travel teams, educational experiences, mentorship. And I think, you know, using NIL, is a way to do both of those things. But I think, you know, what I try, what I try to teach my kids is, and who are now adults, and now I have a grandson and a second one on the way, is confidence and opportunity. 
you know, give the kids confidence that they can make the right decisions, that if something's going the wrong way, that they can step away from it. They don't become part of the pack mentality. Um, and the opportunity is, you know, to give them, if they work hard and take advantage of things, the opportunity to be successful. Your father has obviously meant a lot to you. We have talked about that before. He really, you know, put the framework for you and what you have now, I guess, also brought on to your kids. So how important has he been in your life? Yeah, well, he's given me everything, right? He's given me the opportunity. And through sports, he gave me the confidence. And uh, he was a great mentor. Um, he retired relatively early from his professional career and, and chased my kids around and chased their sporting events. Unfortunately, in 2021, we lost my dad. And part of my foundation of this business was in writing his eulogy. Marcus, you know, he was a junior high gym teacher. He was not a politician. He did not own a business. He never employed anyone. And hundreds of people came to his funeral. And the word that stuck with me was legacy. He had made an impression on his community through his church, through his charitable contributions, through who he was, his neighbors, how he dealt with people in the public. And I think that legacy became a big word for me at that moment. And it's part of what we're trying to do. I challenge young people all the time. If you disappeared today, would anyone care tomorrow? In other words, have you impacted anyone? Have you affected anyone in a positive way? And I think my father did for me and for many others, obviously, the thousands of kids that he taught, but he did for my five children and my three nieces and nephews. And he laid a great foundation and I'm forever thankful. Yeah. That makes you think, right? It's uh... So how do you look at your own, your own legacy? What do you want to leave after? Yeah, well, I, I'm living it, right? So I, I'm comfortable that I have used athletics to better my life. And I've used athletics to better the lives of the people around me. I started a, a youth program that grew to 4,000 students. I started a scholastic program that's put 200 kids in college here in the United States. As I said at Sports Studio, I mentored tens of people, met some of whom have their own businesses now. I think my children are part of my legacy. And so I'm comfortable with who I am. If I disappeared today, I think someone might miss me, which is comforting. But I think there's a lot more to do. I think we can change thousands of lives with this, lives with this company, with this platform. And so my legacy is still being written. And I hope it continues for a very long time. And we're not, you. Uh, you know, we haven't seen the last of you uh, yet for a long time. So uh, on, on this topic with, you know, what uh, to bring on to the next generation and so forth, what is the best advice that you have ever received? I've received a lot of good advice. I've had a lot of good coaches and a lot of good mentors. Um, I don't know that there's anything specific about that. I've been asked that question. Um, I think mostly it's, you know, do the right thing. And it sounds simple, uh, but it's true. You know, whether it's, you know, being professional at work, whether it's making the right choices with your family in society, uh, your habits, your discipline. Um, and I think do the right thing sounds simple, but it's really not easy. And sometimes it's hard to do, but that's why the self-confidence and the opportunity as parents comes into it. We want to give our kids the opportunity to do the right thing. That's great. Um, has there been any bumps on the road in your career? And if so, how did you overcome them? Of course, I don't think you live as long as I have and, and everything's been perfect. Uh, you know, we talked about the sports studio bump in the road on day one, sitting in the corner office thinking I had arrived. Um, there have been other challenges. Sure. I think if you um, start a family, raise a family, there are financial pressures. There are professional choices. Not everyone makes the right choice and goes to the right company. Sometimes those don't work out. Um, you know, I think sometimes you uh, do things as a parent that don't work out and you have to correct and I think um, I've learned from all of my mistakes. Hopefully, I won't repeat them. Hopefully, I'll, I'll get better. But I think part of being an entrepreneur, part of being a risk taker, which I am both, and I guess to some degree an adrenaline junkie, I like the challenge, is that you may misstep once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as they say, if you get knocked down, get back up. And I think that's you know part of the life lessons and part of what athletics has taught me. But I don't think there's anyone that goes unscathed. We all have scars. Definitely.
So adrenaline junkie, well, how does that play out? Do you, uh, you know, throw yourself out of airplanes and bungee jumping or how does that look? Yeah, I don't think I'm that crazy, but, you know, <laughs> I think, I think in my age, after a successful professional career to put everything into a new company and a new industry is a little bit risky, right? And being an entrepreneur and sticking yourself out there and having opinions, you know, like the conversation we're having, you know, these are formed over years and years and years of experiences. Um, and it's hard sometimes to put yourself out there and be criticized. One of the things I learned about Hollywood is, you know, the camera is a drug. You know, it's very addictive to be in front of the camera and have people watch you and listen to you. But it's also challenging because there's always going to be somebody that disagrees. There's always going to be someone taking shots, always going to be someone that doesn't appreciate what you're doing. But you can't let that dissuade you. So the adrenaline for me is to fight through this adversity, to build this brand new company in this brand new industry and wake up every day and not really know what's going to happen during the day. That's kind of a cool process. 100%. So before we sign off here, I just, I read somewhere, I don't know if this is correct, you, that you're writing also another book. Uh, is that uh, ongoing? Is it, uh, because I think I read it a couple, uh, you know, it was an old article that I read. Are yeah. you writing the well, book? I, I've been writing it for a long time. It's a parenting book. It's called 12 year olds win for all the wrong reasons. It's about youth sports. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's about my life journey as a parent and watching young kids who at age 12 dominated on the athletic field or the rink or the court. And by the time they were 16, they were just average. And by the time they were 18, they were out of sports. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because they won too early for the wrong reasons. They were bigger than everyone else. Their parents paid more money for coaches. They had better equipment. Um, and so, you know, not every, there's not a direct line. It's definitely not a straight line from age 12 to 20, age 22, right? And so what are the things that continue to be important? You know, if you're not foundationally strong in terms of competitiveness, in terms of skill development, in terms of handling how to lose, right? And how to be a good teammate, how to be coachable. You know, if you're the 12 year old superstar and mommy and daddy give you a trophy every weekend because you're amazing, sometimes that doesn't work out by the time you're 16, 18 and 22. So it'll be some of those life stories and lessons that I've learned and some anecdotes from people that I respect in the youth sports business. Yeah, I really look forward to reading that. I think that's uh, an important book for many parents to read uh, specifically. So when do you know when is it that you have a scheduled date for release or is it uh, ongoing? It's ongoing. You know, I'm continuing to write it. I've been writing it for a long time in my head. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, I'm pretty busy building the Players NIL, but I, I hope to get that book out in 2024. Oh, awesome. Is there something I haven't asked you yet that you want to mention? No, I just want to say thank you for doing your research. You've done a great job, you know, researching my background and ask great questions about this. And you know, I think the most important thing that I'd like to share as we as we sign off here is that uh, name, image, and likeness is universal around the world. Personal branding, and whether you're an athlete or an artist or just a business person, you know, developing a brand. Today's world of digital marketing is a great opportunity. Platforms like LinkedIn, which is how we met, you know, is an amazing way for you to start to tell your story and your interest in medical science and law in history, all of these things, use it properly and it becomes your digital resume. Make a mistake and don't do the right thing and it becomes, you know, your downfall. And so, you know, pay attention, use this opportunity in society, not just in sports, but in society to create a brand, use digital marketing to network and create opportunities and the world is yours. That's good advice. And uh, thank you for the kind words. And uh, I thank you very much for taking the time, being a total class act through all this period with the scheduling and everything. I really appreciate it. If the listeners want to reach out to you, where do they do that uh, best? Well, our website is theplayersnil.com and you can get our contact information on there. I'm also on LinkedIn. Feel free to follow me, uh, direct message me if you have any questions. On social, we're at theplayersnil on all platforms, at theplayersnil. That's great. Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to be on Sports Management Podcast. Marcus, thank you very much. And I wish you and your family and all of your followers a happy holidays and a safe new year.